1982. Maria Ramos entered Liminal Land all alone on a brisk November morning. She meandered to a ride at the far edge of the park, known as the Anomaly. The Anomaly had recently been shut down for maintenance, but Maria ignored red signs and yellow tape to approach the ride's controls. Park staff simply stood and watched as she managed to turn on the Anomaly and board the ride. For 26 awful minutes, the malfunctioning ride ran on a loop. Even as Maria's body broke, it continued to go around and around. Her skull fractured, her jaw cracked and slipped out of its socket, and her brain was whipped into a thick mush. When Maria's body was unloaded from the anomaly, her ruined face had been shattered and permanently warped into a crooked smile. But Maria Ramos's death isn't the only story that Liminal Land has tried to cover up. No, the deeper you dig, the deeper the pit goes. Death after death, disappearance after disappearance. From the videos, to the website, to all the social media pages, the stories have been scattered to the far reaches of the web. But I've pulled it all together, just for you. I'll explain the story of Liminal Land, go over it with you in detail, and give you my theories. But there's that one awful phrase. It haunts me, stopping my investigation at every turn. You had to be there. What if the archives and evidence don't hold the answers I'm looking for? What if you had to be there to understand the truth? That's where you come in. Now, I know it may be hard to believe... But as an independent investigator who spends every waking moment obsessing over an amusement park that went out of business 40 years ago, I don't get out that often. Thankfully, I don't have to get out of the house to have a great time, thanks to today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. With over 700 unique champions, there's no end to the powerful team compositions you can lead into battle. You'll be able to find champions you think look awesome, no matter your style. Once you've assembled your team, you can dive into 12 challenging dungeons in search of legendary loot. Once your champions are geared up, it's time to prove your might by locking blades with players from around the world in PvP duels. And it's still constantly receiving updates that add fresh content and quality of life changes. No matter where you are, you can always log in to customize your champions, tweak your strategy, and take on the world. You're never more than a few clicks away from joining millions of players in the world of Teleria. The thing that keeps me coming back are the characters designs. I'm currently trying to make a team of horrific monstrosities, samurai, knights, and angels. New players can get the epic champion Stag Knight with a skin designed by JonTron by using the promo code JTSKIN in-game before October 7th. Additionally, log in on seven different days before October 23rd to get the legendary Sun Wukong, Raid's take on the Monkey King. You can download Raid Shadow Legends by using my link at the top of the description or by scanning my QR code. You'll be rewarded with Talia, an epic champion from the Sacred Order, plus tons of other helpful items to give you a fighting chance. Then, come find me under the username Chromudgeon. You can even join my clan and help me try to unlock my boy Corvus, and I'll see you in-game. He shall be mine. (laughs) Kind of just blacked out for a minute. Right, you, you applied for a position at my investigation agency. I arranged this interview because your application was the closest to meeting my needs. In the end, it all came down to this one question right here. Have you ever been to Liminal Land? Which you responded to with a resounding, maybe. I actually had to dig your application out of the trash because I threw it away after reading it. Then I read the other applications, and I realized that yours was the closest I'd get to a yes. I have no idea what maybe means, so let me get you up to speed. In the late 80s, a string of disappearances took place in Lake Valley, New Mexico. I've been trying to figure out what happened to these people. Their stories deserve to be told. The only thread connecting them all is the park, Liminal Land. I can tell I'm on the brink of splitting this whole thing wide open. It's just... I need someone who was there. Someone who set foot inside the place, saw it with their own eyes. I don't know if they were drugging up guests or keeping the place gassed or what. However they did it, no one seemed to care about the horrors taking place at Liminal Land while they were inside the park. As much as I wish I could do it alone, I've hit my limit. 
I never went to Liminal Land as a kid, and I'm sure as heck not getting a chance anytime soon, so please, tell me that maybe means you've actually been there before. Hmm. It's better than nothing. You've got the job. <laughs> yeah, sure, bud. This is definitely a paid position. Look, we have work to do. You and I could just dive right into my investigation notes, but let's try to put everything in its proper context. We need to understand what this park was to the people who kept it running. The visitors. Put yourself in their shoes. Choose which are about to take their first steps through the gate into liminal land. I can only paint you a partial picture, but I've read the accounts from hundreds of guests. If anyone can help you piece together your lost memories, I'd say it's me. And if we can jog your memory, maybe you can start to give me some helpful answers. Liminal land, on the surface, seemed like the typical American amusement park. It promised thrills and novelty at every turn, and often delivered on those promises. Every visit to Liminal Land began by entering through the somewhat terrifying front gate, fashioned after the gate of the real-world Luna Park. While the bright lights and colors may be appealing to families, there's something undeniably strange about the entrance. I'm sure it was hard to shake the sense that you were being consumed as you stepped into what would be the throat of a giant human head. Thankfully, the other side of the gate held untold joy. Families standing at the entrance to the park would have been assaulted with an array of sights, sounds, and smells. Rides so bright and colorful, you seem almost supernaturally drawn to them. It's probably just the natural urge to follow the crowd as it surges through the park. You look at the array of faces around you, but they seem blurry. Almost like looking at faces in a dream. Perhaps your parents were right about you needing glasses. Glasses? No, no, this isn't the time for something so mundane as optometry. This is exactly why you're here. A momentary escape from the doctor's visits and school projects, from obligation itself. Enjoy the dry desert breeze warming your skin, but there's also a chill in the air, like standing near the opening to a very deep cave. It's sort of pleasant, in a way, at least. It also makes your hair stand on end. Guts grumble and grab your attention firmly. Popcorn, funnel cake, the unmistakable scent of chlorine and summer. It conjures up the sort of memories anyone can relate to, but not the sort of memories you want to remember. Instead of being reminded of sun by the pool, you can't help but think of being scolded by your parents, fights with friends, and the cold feeling of being unwanted, alone. There, hiding just behind the pleasant aromas of sweet treats and fond memories, there's a damp, musty stench, like a wet basement or a towel that never fully dried. Liminal Land offers up a memory of youth, but it's tainted. It all begins to weigh on you. As your mind goes in loops, reflecting on past pains, a group of school children bump into you running towards the sign labeled Paradise Playrooms. Their beleaguered teacher hurriedly follows along behind them, trying to keep up. The kids that passed look so happy. All around you, you can hear children playing, parents conversing, and the almost overwhelming volume of coasters running at max capacity. Somehow, above it all, there's laughter. An uproar so loud it makes you want to slap your hands over your ears. But wouldn't you like to laugh like that too? All you have to do is pick a ride. Liminal Land played host to a variety of attractions. First, there were the aforementioned Paradise Playrooms. While the playrooms were intended to function as an alternative to daycare, children seemed as content to be there as they were to visit any of the other attractions in the park. Kids had so much fun in the maze that they would often become lost in the rooms for hours on end, which, surprisingly, left parents unworried. After all, the parents were usually away enjoying the other attractions at Liminal Land, such as the Skyliner, 
a giant spire extending up, 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 seemingly into eternity. Guests would board the ride before being slingshotted up into endless blue. Despite its gargantuan size, it was often overshadowed by attractions such as the Hall of Walls. Just past the centrifuge, 800,000 square feet of continuous gray walls formed the world's premier escape experience. Guests were placed deep within a monolithic maze and tasked with locating one of seven unique exits to the megastructure. Keep in mind, only one of these exits was actually operable on any given day, so each experience in the hall was equally and uniquely unpleasant. Rarely did the attractions at Liminal Land deliver so clearly on the park's promise that you'll lose yourself. So... Anything seem familiar yet? Nothing else, huh? Well, maybe something else will spark your memory. There are still plenty of other popular attractions. The park was intended to compete directly with Disneyland. Did a pretty good job of it too during the 80s. The first guests at Liminal Land entered the park with some idea of what they were getting into. Coasters, kiddie rides, fun day with family. But Liminal Land wasn't content to leave guests satisfied. To be a real contender in the market, they needed to really wow visitors. But before you can exceed expectations, you first have to meet them, give the people what they think they want, then give them more than they ever bargained for. So, while there were several truly unique experiences at Liminal Land, there were also several traditional rides. Don't worry though, each one puts its own spin on tradition. Take, for example, Serpentine, a steel coaster that was built from old metal tubing. This ride's hot new feature was gross negligence. Yeah, it seems from reports that the ride was quite literally on the brink of falling apart or toppling over due to shoddy construction. Also though, some people reported that it gave the ride the sense that it was alive, but <laughs> that couldn't be the case, right? Whoever heard of something as dumb as a living amusement park? <laughs> that's, that's the stupidest thing I- the most successful attempt to build on tradition was with the laugh track. This ride resulted from decades of research into forced laughter. Every seat on the laugh track was equipped with a compression band that would squeeze the rider's chest at regular intervals. Repeated compression induced a state of euphoria through violent and voluntary laughter and was supposed to heighten the experience of the ride. Apparently it worked because the ride managed to become one of Liminal Land's most popular attractions rising to the top alongside more novel experiences like the Hall of Walls and Subliminal Land. Subliminal Land was arguably the most impressive attraction in the entire park. 36 levels of interconnected water parks, could you imagine? The park advertised itself as a whole new world underneath your feet. Park goers seemed to agree that it lived up to the hype as just like our world, much of Subliminal Land was never really explored. As you went down through the levels, they became progressively larger. While the upper levels of the attraction only consisted of a handful of pools, by the time you reached floor nine, the levels could be as large as a full water park. Even so, the floors were still considered to be part of the hospitality sector, the region of subliminal land where park staff was nearby and eager to help. Lots of families traveled to these floors and had a fun time splashing around with each other. However, if you were looking for a truly unique experience, you had to go deeper. Starting on floor 10, there was a massive jump in square footage. Levels 10 to 36 were known as the Serenity Ward, and it was hard not to feel dwarfed by the sheer size of the space. Even promotional materials specifically warned not to travel to these levels if you were prone to autophobia, the fear of being alone. Virtually no one entered the lower levels due to their scale, but there were some interesting sights to see, such as the neon pool rooms on level 14, or this horrific looking fish thing from floor 27. The lowest level of subliminal land is by far the most significant, but also the most mysterious. We know that it was repurposed from the bones of an older facility, but I'll save that for later in my investigation notes. Just know that I'm totally convinced that subliminal land is much more important than our available accounts suggest. I might not have the evidence to back it up, but I've learned to trust a hunch every now and then. Still nothing? It's fine. No sense beating yourself up over it. Let's just keep moving. 
Look, there's still a few more attractions a kid like you might have remembered. Hold on. Uh, there's uh, the centrifuge. There's the wheel. The Home? That was Liminal Land's solution to guest housing. See, they figured that they could keep people in the park longer if they provided accommodations to guests. So they built this fake neighborhood under the park. Tricky stuff, if you ask me. Too much space under there. Too easy to get lost just trying to get back up to the surface. Why do you ask? You remember home, but not the attractions. What kind of kid remembers the hotel, but not the park? Whatever. Anyway, what do you remember? Maybe what? You found your family though, right? I mean, you're here. Obviously you got out. I'm not sure how to tell you this, but it's a bit unnerving you experienced that in home, of all places. A lot of people went missing there, so I'd say you're one of the lucky few, but you might find some of the materials we're about to go over to be pretty disturbing. Some people aren't okay with finding out about how close they've come to danger in the past. Are you okay with continuing? You're already looking kind of pale. Yeah, works for me. I think we've gotten as far as we're going to get with the immersive method. Time to do some real digging. I've done my best to assemble a narrative from all the broken pieces, but goodness. The pieces were very, very broken. Nevertheless, I've drawn from every source, scraped every last link or website I could find, and I think I've done a decent job of putting the events in order. The story of Liminal Land begins long before its parent company, Charon, ever broke ground in Lake Valley. I mentioned that Subliminal Land was built on the bones of a pre-existing facility, Lake Valley Observations, or LVO for short. What did this facility do, you might ask, to which I say, good question. All we really know is that LVO was working on the production of quote-unquote clean energy, but what that really means, no one knows for certain. It could be related to nuclear power, Certain portions of the facility were very dangerous due to constant reactions taking place inside of them. But nothing specifically states that they're nuclear reactions, so I'll hold my tongue for the time being. It's assumed that LVO operations had ceased by the end of 1973, since we have photos of the abandoned guts of the facility. These photos were likely taken by Charon during purchasing considerations, though we can't confirm that information as of yet. What we do know for certain is that Charon decided to go through with the purchase. And the following year, they began to advertise the development of Liminal Land just off County Road B005. In 1975, Liminal Land saw its grand opening and welcomed its first guests to the park. Little is known about the attractions that the park maintained when it opened, but clearly, families loved them. In 1977, Liminal Land broke every record for attendance and guest satisfaction that it had seen previously. Part of that was a result of the introduction of the park's first experimental coaster, the aforementioned Laugh Track. While this year set new standards for the park, it was also the beginning of a disturbing trend. The Laugh Track was the first of many rides that clearly posed a danger to Liminal Land patrons, regardless of their contentment with the experience. The Laugh Track itself was suspected to cause asphyxiation, and in subsequent years, Serpentine, the Hall of Walls, and Subliminal Land would be introduced or updated. We already covered the dangerous oversights plaguing Serpentine as a ride, but let's not forget about the hall. The maze promised that visitors were going to get lost, and at over 800,000 square feet, how could that possibly be safe? That's way too much floor space for park staff to cover when trying to assist injured or panicking guests. Don't even get me started on subliminal land. Think about what I just said to you a few minutes ago. Certain portions of the LVO facility were extremely dangerous to enter. Foremost among them was the hub 
a massive room so poisoned by reactions that it was deadly just to step inside. And where, of all places, do you think that Haran decided to build Subliminal Land? Directly on top of the hub. In fact, the hub was ultimately converted into the lowest floor of Subliminal Land. I'm not sure if the room continued to be as dangerous during Liminal Land's heyday, but I doubt Haran had the resources to make it habitable. I mean, we're talking about a private entity taking their first major venture. It was, it was profit over responsibility, over safety, everything. It was so careless. There was no corner Haran wouldn't cut to get guests in the park and to keep them there. But that's the thing. At the end of the day, no one cared, not even the guests. They all just let it happen. Why didn't they leave? I'm so sick of hitting this same wall. I don't know why they wouldn't leave. I wasn't there. You had to be there. <sighs> it's just confusing. You know, the, the money angle doesn't make any sense. There's no profit in harming your guests. The whole project implodes without them, so why? Yeah, you're right. Thanks. In 1981, Haran recognized they were sleeping on a gold mine. They had failed to capitalize on another one of LVO's most notable features the massive underground housing development that they used to accommodate their researchers. See, when you're running a project as big as LVO out in the desert, you've got to provide some place out of the sun for your people to stay. And what's more out of the sun than underground? So they started digging, and they dug for a long, long time, because the subterranean neighborhood that they built was way bigger than they needed for their scientists. It didn't make any sense for LVO, but it perfectly met the needs of Haran's ever-growing customer base. Plenty of guests were happy to shell out big bucks for residency under the park, especially after Haran converted the entire facility into a 1970s-style neighborhood, complete with painted skies, plastic grass, and plaster trees. They called it the Holistic and Opportune Mutual Experience, or H-O-M-E, home. It was supposed to remove the need to ever leave Lake Valley, why go back to the humdrum monotony of life when you've got food, fun, and shelter right here on the liminal land premises? This home away from home became permanent for many visitors, not always by choice. Some of the most unsettling documents we have are the later accounts from home workers, such as this memo written by the head of maintenance. According to him, these long-term visitors would just let themselves rot away under the park, wallowing in their own filth and garbage. It got so bad that Haran couldn't even keep the cleaning crew staffed. Team after team abandoned the project entirely. Each time, the monumental task of maintaining home got worse. The stench of human waste grew to be unbearable, but there was also something darker going on in the neighborhood. It wasn't uncommon to hear the screams of children reverberating through the halls, voices just around the corner, a whisper behind you. But the unshakable dread of being alone was a constant companion. Follow the sounds all you like, but you'll never trace it back to the source. furnace. Hmm. Well, that's concerning. Doesn't matter. Not yet, anyway. Right now, we've got to keep on track. While each of these developments should have been alarming on the face of things, the real nightmare hadn't even begun yet. The dangerous rides, the expansive megastructures, the mismanagement, these issues merely formed the backdrop for nearly a decade of misery. In the early 80s, several tapes were produced that have been essential 
to piecing together a fuller picture of what happened at Liminal Land. We've recovered a series of five tapes so far, but it wouldn't surprise me if more found their way online in the future. There are countless others trying to uncover the mystery of Liminal Land, after all. The tapes are as follows. The Channel 5 sign-off, the Visitor Satisfaction training tape, a tape from New Mexico State Police regarding the deaths of Rick Ackerman, Lena Sorensen, and Maria Ramos, an altered home training tape, and another police tape regarding the disappearance of Angie and Sofia Munoz. You may have noticed a couple of these playing while we've talked, such as the Channel 5 sign-off. This tape gives us the names of several of the missing people we've been looking into, but not much else besides. The next tape, the Visitor Satisfaction Training Tape, was produced to help staff identify visitors who were in distress. The ultimate purpose of this was to keep guests on the premises for as long as possible. One weird detail about this tape is that it appears to have been tampered with. About three quarters through the video, text begins to pop up on screen. The park is a L. The footage cuts there, so we have no clue what the full message is. Some early viewers thought this said, the park is AI, but you can clearly see that's an L. The most popular theory now is that it says, the park is alive, but I'm not sure I agree with that either. To me, there looks to be a space between the A and L. I'm not confident enough to say that other people are wrong, but we need to keep an open mind about how we interpret this clue. I don't think it's been fully solved. The next video in the series comes to us from New Mexico State Police, and it provided the details I shared with you at the beginning of the video regarding the liminal land anomaly and the death of Maria Ramos in 1982. While Maria's was the first recorded death at liminal land, the anomaly would soon claim the lives of two others, Lena Sorensen and Rick Ackerman. Lena was an elementary school teacher who visited the park on a field trip with her first grade class in 1984. She wanted to show the kids a good time and make it a special day for them, so she decided to take them to one of the park's newest attractions, the Paradise Playrooms. There, she watched the children play with one another. It was hard not to mirror their happy faces and bright smiles. She stood to the side, quietly appreciating their joy before slipping out of the playrooms for reasons unknown. For eight hours, the children explored the playrooms as if nothing was wrong. Lena was never seen alive again. Her broken body was found crumpled in the dirt near the anomaly. Her jaw had cracked, letting her mouth hang open in what could loosely be called a smile. Four years later, Rick Ackerman would visit the park with his wife and three children. At the earliest opportunity, Rick left his family behind to ride the anomaly alone. Once again, Rick's deformed body was found with an unnatural grin spread across his face. Out of the tapes, this is the one that has always stuck with me the most. Something about the way it presents the information, it's so clinical, uncaring. I can't help but think of the person behind the pain. It breaks my heart to imagine the care that Lena had for her class. Those kids never even noticed she was missing. <sighs> the next tape is the one that I've been most eager to show you. You said you remembered home, right? Well, this tape is from inside the facility. Sort of. It starts out with an admittedly disturbing training video from Haran. It gives employees plenty of questionable directives, such as remove any and all doors, windows, or thresholds that can potentially serve as an exit from the home entertainment area. This still baffles me. How were guests even meant to spend money in the park if they're sealed below it? While that in and of itself would warrant investigation, the particular copy I have in my possession has something even more unsettling. Four and a half minutes into the video, the training tape stops and is replaced by footage of an unidentified individual wandering through home itself. Bright fluorescent lights hum far overhead to simulate a sunny day, and the walls are painted with natural imagery. It all comes together to create an uncanny scene. Home fails at every level to simulate a typical American neighborhood. It's perverted by the presence of towering concrete walls, metal scaffolding, and the overwhelming sense of inauthenticity. 
The video contains a scattering of text in addition to the found footage. The first message reads, Do not follow strange sounds. Do not enter a stranger's home. Whoever's recording clearly doesn't receive these warnings, however. He ventures deeper into one of the homes along the false street and finds that it's filled with a random assortment of furniture. While the interior may be furnished, it doesn't seem to be inhabited. More text appears on screen. Never leave a passage unblocked. Curiosity becomes regret. The video shows a rundown part of the facility and a door with an orange glow below it. We can hear burning from behind the door and... Well, I think I just need to let you watch this for yourself. The video cuts to our aspiring videographer while he's running deeper and deeper into home. It becomes increasingly clear just how little of the complex was intended to be used as housing, as there are miles upon miles of randomly constructed hallways and corridors. The man filming comes to a crossroads, where he's surrounded by exit signs of varying colors. Red, green, blue, and white. Another message displays four lines of text each written in a color corresponding to one of the exit signs. Blue may never be true. Green, you'll never be seen. White may never be right. Red, you're already dead. Honestly, I only just noticed that the last word of each line rhymes with the color it's written in. I have no clue what that means, but it might become important as more tapes are uncovered. In any case, the tape cuts once more, and we see a sea of green signs. The man runs to what appears to be a way out, but we never see him escape. A final series of messages displays. Those who seek departure will lose themselves. We hope you learned from others' mistakes. We hope you have a pleasant day here at Liminal Land. Something about this final message makes me think this footage hasn't been altered after all. It strikes me as though we're watching an example of what happens when someone steps out of line. Maybe the person we're seeing is a Haran employee who tried to abandon their job within home. In that sense, the whole thing really is a training tape. I was worried you might ask that. Look, I can't really talk about this without sounding like I've gone crazy, so... Some investigators have discovered evidence that suggests Caron may have been using Liminal Land as a... front. <sighs> Human sacrifice. I know it sounds like a conspiracy theory rather than genuine investigative work, but the evidence is compelling. It all started when we managed to force our way onto a hidden page of the website. What we found was this. This bull-faced creature is Moloch, the ancient deity of the Canaanites. Moloch is thought to be a demon that appears as a bull-human hybrid, one which craves sacrifice. It's weird enough that this image appears on the website, but the ties with Liminal Land go a bit deeper than that. I mean, the park's mascot is a humanoid bull named Molly. Molly, Moloch, are, are you kidding me? They weren't even trying to be subtle about this. They put it right out in front of everyone like no one would notice, and apparently they were right. It slipped right by everyone. The ties with Moloch also add some disturbing context to some of the evidence we found. The next tape, our final tape, is another document from the New Mexico State Police investigation. This tape gives us the details of the search for Angie Munoz, one of the missing people in the Channel 5 sign-off. Notably, 
we know the exact date that this tape was made. May 20th, 1987. Exactly two years before the incident at Liminaland that shut everything down. Sophia Munoz, Angie's mother, insists that her daughter ran away in the middle of the night. But if that's the case, why did Angie run? In their hunt for the truth, police came across a series of drawings by Angie that depicted an experience she had with someone or something that she called mommy's friend. The story was so disquieting that police immediately initiated a manhunt for Sophia, but she was never found. The first drawing depicts Angie's mom, and uh, I'm gonna be honest, if my mom looked like that, I'd scream. We then learn that Angie's story centers around Liminaland. Angie was initially excited about going to the park, but then her mother made her sad by taking her to a house with more houses inside of it. Presumably, this is referring to home. Angie must have been disappointed that they were going to the accommodations area rather than visiting one of the park's attractions. We then get this page that just says, Mommy looked, but we can't make out what the last word says. It looks like the word was scratched out with a crayon. Maybe by Angie, but why would she erase part of her own story? The next page tells us that Sophia was looking for a friend, but we don't know what that means exactly. The following drawing might once have elaborated on this point, but it's too covered up for us to decipher what it was. The words, follow me, it's okay, are written out. We then see a door, and Angie tells us that inside this door was the friend that they had been searching for. Sophia's friend appears to be a man with bull horns coming out of his head. The spitting image of Moloch. Did the two of them really have a run-in with some ancient demon from biblical times? I can't imagine that would have ended well. But considering Angie has been missing for almost 40 years, I suspect that it didn't. It's hard to say what would have compelled Sophia to take her daughter deep into home, but... The same as what? Huh. Solid point. Let's double check. The bull noises make me think that that must be the same door. I think Angie must have been... I think they did something terrible to Angie in that room. Considering the sound of the flames and the heat that you described earlier, the Canaanites believed that Moloch preferred burnt offerings. That's what it seems like. Look, I, I'm not going to sit here and speculate. But it has to. Even in my dreams, it's right there taunting me. It's the reason none of this makes any sense. The first phrase I read when I began investigating. It comes to me in many forms. Wish you were here. Where were you when it happened? You had to be there. I had to be there. I wasn't. You were. <sighs> I, uh, I just... I just thought of something. What if you weren't there? Nope, that's not what I mean. I mean, you weren't there. None of us were. I think I've been looking at this all wrong. What if that phrase, you had to be there, wasn't stopping my investigation? What if it had been the key all along? It's time to go over the final chapter in Liminal Land's story and to get a little bit more acquainted with the company behind it all.
all we have is speculation. Despite all the investigators we've got working on this case, we've all been coming at things from the same angle. You and I have to try something new. We'll step out of line and try a new approach. Even if I turn out to be wrong, at least I'm adding another voice, another perspective to the investigation. And maybe that's what it takes to find the truth. Liminal Land's greatest mystery is in its final moments. Some projects slowly slip into obscurity. That was not the case with Haran's Park. On May 20th, 1989, Liminal Land's story ended abruptly and unceremoniously. For such a wildly successful venture, you would have expected news of the Liminal Land incident to spread like wildfire. The thing is, mainstream media only ever acknowledged the incident on one occasion. The joy and laughter that once filled the park fell silent in an instant, but no one seemed to care. Firm details about that day are scarce, but it's rumored that the bodies of the victims remain in the park more than 34 years later. A grand monument to industry, rising out of the desert and ornamented with corpses. Something happened on that day. Where were you when it happened? I wasn't there. Neither were you. Everyone who was at Liminal Land when it happened is gone now. We've ignored the elephant in the room for long enough. Haran. See, while we discussed the park's ties to Moloch, there's another supernatural figure that's been hiding in the background this whole time. Haran himself. The company borrows its name from a being from Greek mythology. Charon had an important job. He was the ferryman that guided fallen souls across the river Styx, the vast mire that divided the land of mortals from the underworld. A spot on Charon's ferry granted one passage between worlds. Why did Charon, the company, choose to name themselves after this particular being? What was it meant to symbolize? Shh, that was rhetorical. I already have an answer. <laughs> Years of working cold cases, but now it feels like my brain is on fire. Haran, the creature, was a liminal being. He offered a way for mankind to move from life to death. Without him, humanity would have no way to pass into the other side of eternity. No way to enter the afterlife. But on his ferry, there was a singular point of transition. A place between places. A liminal space. He said it! Karan, the company, must have felt that they were on a similar mission. Even their logo, the hourglass, is a symbol of the impermanence of man and our incessant march towards death. We've been running into dead ends this whole time because we assumed that Haran was operating as an ordinary company. We assumed they were after profit, but that never sat right with me. No, they've never been concerned with money. Too much of went on in the park was ultimately unprofitable. I mean, endangering your own guests or trapping them inside underground facilities. Guests can't spend money if they're dead and buried. Profit wasn't an issue. From the very beginning, Haran wanted to create a place where you could lose yourself. Every single space in the park was designed to keep you in liminal land for as long as as possible. They didn't care about money. They cared that you were there. That's the part I don't want to confront, personally. I'm not entirely sure that Haran was in the wrong. Look, you're right. That's obviously barbaric. But stick with me. This is by far my most speculative theory, but what's the point of going out on a limb if I won't see where it leads? I think that Haran was trying to grant its guests passage into the afterlife. And I think that Liminal Land was their ferry. The park itself was the boat that would carry people into some higher plane of existence. However, they must have run into two big issues. When the ferry set sail, it could only take those who were waiting for it at the park. 
and they didn't know when the ferry would set sail. That's why it was so important to keep people in the park. If the guests were stuck in liminal land, then of course they would be there when it happened. They waited for over a decade, biding their time and doing their best to create attractions that would keep guests lost inside the park until their voyage. That's what happened on May 20th, 1989. The ferry came and went along with all of its passengers, the Liminal Land Park goers, to pass into the afterlife. You had to be there. I'm still left with questions. I have no clue how Haran would have learned to do this. Maybe Moloch taught them. Maybe that's why they were making sacrifices to begin with. Maybe I'm wrong about everything, and maybe I just want things to have turned out all right for the people I've been looking for. It won't surprise me if this theory is proved wrong by the next document we uncover, but I'm not trying to figure it all out on my own. As I've said time and time again, there are countless other investigators putting their mental might to the challenge that Liminal Land poses. I just want to contribute to the search for truth. I don't have to be the one who finds it. That we're stuck on the wrong side of eternity? I'm afraid so. If Caron's motives really were altruistic, then we've... We've lost everything. It's almost easier to think that they were evil because the alternative is so much worse. Otherwise, we got left behind. All because we weren't in the park when it happened. We're stuck in finitude, in mortality, in pain, and in suffering, and in misery. I think back to Liminal Land's original motto. Like the souls of the lost calling out to us from the far side of the river, I hear it. Wish you were here. I wish I was there too. I'm Curmudgeon. Thanks for watching. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed the video. I wanted to take a short unscripted segment here at the very end just to kind of speak to you all in a little bit more of a personal way. The channel went absolutely crazy over the last couple of months and I just, I have to say thank you. It didn't really feel right to try to thank you guys with my disembodied voice. So this is why I'm on camera. Just, you know, I wanted to, I want you guys to know how genuinely I mean it. Just, it, it's been amazing. Thank you so much for all the support. Uh, I also want to give a massive thanks to all of my patrons. Thank you, Moonvale. Thank you, IDGA Funk. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Max. Thank you, Asha. And thank you, Tally. It's still kind of just crazy to me that people would even consider supporting the channel, but, uh, I mean, I honestly don't have the words to express how grateful I am. Thank you guys so much. Hopefully I did you proud with this video. I also want to take a moment here to thank the fan artists who have been doing fan art of Mudgeon. It's been so much fun to get to see everything that you guys are doing with the character. I'm so glad you like him. If you are interested in submitting some fan art of your own, you can tag me in it on Instagram or Twitter. That's the best way to get it in front of me and to ensure that I'm actually gonna see it. But yeah, just thank you so much for all of the fan art. It's so, so cool. I, I mean, yeah, it's just awesome. You guys are awesome. So yeah, please show some support to these wonderful artists. And yeah, thank you guys so much for just supporting the channel and getting it where it's gotten. Uh, anytime I post an update on like the subscriber count or something, you guys are always in the comments telling me that I deserve it, but I really don't. Like, I'm just a dude making videos. There are so many creators out there who 
have been doing this a lot longer than I have, and they still haven't garnered the support that you guys are showing me. So yeah, just, it, it means the world to me. And I just wanted to say thank you so much. And with that, I'm Curmudgeon. Thanks for watching. Thanks again to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to try it out using my link in the description or this QR code.